Welcome to Novel Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so we can use them to make ourselves better and more effective writers. Now, on with our program. Welcome and thank you for listening. This is your host, Mike Consul. In the spotlight during this episode is Jess Lowry. Hi, this is Jess Lowry. I am an Amazon Charts bestselling, Edgar nominated, Anthony and ITW thriller award winning author and i'm excited to be here and on the the, the side that the jess hasn't told you is that she is also the recipient of more than 400 rejection letters from <laughs> agents and maybe publishing houses and so on more than 400 so um and she says very cheerfully she can do this now that she's you know gotten i think it's 423 rejection notices before she signed her first book contract and she can say that with good cheer now because she's got 21 novels out there and a nonfiction book. And she's straddled genres, uh, which a, a lot of people would say, Jess, you really shouldn't do. It's kind of like, hey, wait a minute. You, you've you got you're a, a thriller writer and that's what's working for you. Why do you want to do a young adult novel? I know they're hot, but your audience is going to say, what's going on here? You haven't right. had that problem, apparently, huh? Uh, did did anybody did anybody suggest hey stay away from that just stick stay in your lane or did they always say um hey you know what you're doing just just go ahead and, and uh, work it with a different genre now i don't know that anybody ever tells a writer they know what they're doing <laughs> <laughs> my agent was not thrilled that i write across genres i have a magical realism book i've uh, as you said i've got thrillers i've got a young adult book and i just signed a three book contract for a young adult trilogy and the thing is, like most writers, I read widely, and so I write widely. And I, about five years ago, was having dinner with Dana Kay, and she's a wonderful pu publicist out of Chicago. And I was telling Dana, I said, I, I want to write all these different books. My agent's not thrilled. What do you think I should do? And she said, you just have to brand yourself. And on the spot, she said, you know what you write about with every book? Secrets. And she said, it doesn't matter the genre, you write about secrets. And so that's my brand. I write about secrets. You're the secret writer. Yes. People aren't even supposed to know you're writing. You're so secret. You're, you're deep, <laughs> deep underground. Um, now, tell me what makes Ms. K so wonderful, because there's there's writers out there with publicists. And no doubt they're thinking, is my publicist really getting this, getting the work done? Are they really as successful with me or doing as much for me as they should be doing? Uh, what what makes a good publicist? What makes Ms. K a star at what she does? She is, first of all, very personable, which is important. She's got great connections, but more to the point, she tells you what she can do and what she cannot do. Because a publicist's job is to connect you to, you know, magazines, uh, readers, uh, newspapers, TV shows, they can't, a lot of that is out of their control, even if they're amazing at their job. And so she's just very upfront about what she can and cannot do. So sometimes she'll tell you the, the one thing that you want more than anything, she'll say, uh, be realistic. I can't do that. That I, but, I don't do magic. Magic happens in realism in your books, magical realism, but not in real go. life most of the time. Well, and you know, for most of my books, I don't work with a publicist. So the Corey Girls just came out November 1st, and it's doing really well, I am pleased to say. And with that book, I just came up with fun little boxes, and I sent them to 150 reviewers and readers, and it just really took off. Wow. That's always good to hear. Any, I mean, that's magic right there for any, any writer uh, and any reader that can, that, uh, can embrace uh, you know, some, somebody new, something new. It right. makes me wonder about um, your, uh, you obviously have these writing skills, but what, well, let me put it this way. Elmore Leonard, back when he was alive, people would say, well, they could say it today because his, his work has lived beyond him, that he writes dialogue like he invented it. What right. aspect of your game uh, is your strongest? Is it cre the character creation is it dialogue is it your expository writing is it setting scenes is it uh your uh, i don't I, I don't want to throw a bunch of adjectives out there because that's the sign of a bad novelist just flooding <laughs> the zone with adjectives you tell me what's what's the biggest strength in your game would you say your well, and first of all, elmore leonard is was fantastic at dialogue but he did not sell well in his lifetime and so 
Um, if people have not read him, they should go to him. But it's sort of a sign that it doesn't matter how good you are always. It's not, it's sort of luck sometimes. But as far as what my specialty is, I think it is the feeling you get when you're reading it. And I don't know what to attribute it to, but if you're reading my crime fiction, you will just feel dread the whole time. Oh. And if you're reading my young adult, you will feel propelled the whole time. And so whatever makes that feeling, I don't think it's plotting, but I think plot has a lot to do with it. I think it's where plot meets character. So it's kind of creating a vibe or a mood. Yes. That- and so you want to put people in that place. That's well, that's and that's part of the magic of writing. It's hard to do. That's a that's a good thing to have as one of the strengths of your game because that's uh, not easy to do. You know, um, the other thing that's not easy to do that you're a proponent of is, at least for yourself, is you're an avid people watcher. And I say it's not easy to do because you don't want to be sitting in a public place necessarily staring at people, but you want to pick up their ticks and their habits. And and I mean, you kind of can. Uh, you can just come up with these uh, phrases or even characters based on real life people that you're seeing there. You can start, I used to play this game with my wife where I'd see somebody and I'd say something about them as a first stroke towards fleshing them out. And then she would add something and then I would add something and uh, we'd like kind of flesh out this character. Um, It's a fun game to play. But talk about your people watching. You're an avid people watcher. How does that, how do you people watch? Where do you people watch? And how does that translate into your writing? Well, and I love that you guys play that game. That sounds very, very fun. And I end up just, when I go out for coffee or when I go out anywhere, I end up just slack jawed staring at people. I need to get better. (laughs) I really do. And I, the only thing that I consistently do is I have paper and pen when I go out and I write down snippets of conversation or a specific ways somebody is holding themselves or the way that they, uh, you know, look embarrassed as they take a bite of their muffin. Just those very human, very small moments. I do not assume I'll remember them and I write them down. And at the end of the day, I collect them into a big file. And then I work them into, I work them into my books, but I went ahead and got a degree in sociology is how much I like people watching and not just the behaviors we see, but, but what led to them and how, and how they affect the people around them. I'm fascinated by that. Well, you know, uh, I, one of the things that you wrote on your website that I pilfer to hear uh, that I, I really like is that you say, I've said it before. I'll say it again. When I write, I feel like I'm in the right place at the right time. And that is not a sensation to be wasted. Uh, But even though it's always satisfying, it's never easy. The reason I like that quotation is that I think there's a lot of people who sit and write, or sometimes they sit and write and they say, this is not, they don't feel like they're in the right place or doing the right thing. They start to sit there and question, am I really a writer or is this a fool's you know, uh, a, a fool's flight of fancy. Uh, do I really feel good sitting here? You're saying that when you write, you feel the sensation. Uh, you feel like you're in the right place at the right time. Talk about that a little bit. Well, it's com- it's complex because it's not, I don't very often feel like I just created good writing. I'm a full-time novelist. I write two books a year. Uh, when I'm in the writing phase of writing a project, I write seven days a week. And it is hard every single time to put myself in the chair. It is absolutely hard to sit down and say, I'm going to do this. And I have been doing this for 20 years. And so it's not getting any easier. I don't suspect it will. But when I do finally sit down and when I'm finally putting words on the page, it feels physically there's a warmth. There's just a connection to something that I don't feel anywhere else in my life. And so it's not necessarily thinking this is going to be a great book or even this is a great scene. It's just that feeling of this is what I'm supposed to be doing right now. And it's very soft. It's very quiet. You have to listen for it. But once you feel it when you're writing or I assume when you're painting or, um, you know, building a house or any creative project, if you're if it's your thing, you will you will feel that. And once you feel it, you can't forget about it. You keep going back for it. Now, you uh, blog for Psychology Today. So talk about the psychological aspect of this. What is the uh, trip point or psychologically when somebody, even even veteran writers like yourself, when you hear this all the time, 
it's really hard to sit down and write. It's it's hard just to, to get, get seated and get started. Much better after you get started, but it's it's those first steps of sitting down, firing up your laptop and so on. Uh, what's going on mentally, uh, do you think, with most people? I know you can't speak for everybody, but what is the resistance, the fear, the insecurity? Um, maybe you can give voice to that a little bit, given that you're not only a sociologist, a former sociology uh, professor, but you're 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 also in, into the psychology component of things. Do you have a psychology degree, or are you a, a no? Uh, I just I just pop, make that up. Popular I make that up. <laughs> but you, you blog no... you blog for psychology today. Yes, and specifically on the on the healing power of writing. So I come at that from the from the perspective ah. of a writer. Um, and, and the science of that is fantastic. I talk about it in my TEDx talk, also in my nonfiction book, Rewrite Your Life. But the, the transformative power of writing just 15 minutes a day, five days a week, even if you have no intention of it being a novel or publishing it, if, even if it's just little scraps of free writing about your day, is profoundly transformative. But, that, but the act of writing as a discipline, uh, especially if you're doing it as a career, the psychology of that pushback you know, I ask writers about this all the time, and it it's variations on the same theme, which is it's you're creating worlds, you're creating things that were not there before. Uh, you're taking your imagination and you're choosing to share it with the world, and it's a big undertaking. Mm -hmm. It it's something that's kind of scary if you think about it. If yeah. you slow down, think about I'm writing, I'm creating this world, and I'm going to expect strangers to pay money. <laughs> to read about it and give me hours of their time to take my ideas seriously. It's, 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 a it's a big ask. It's a big undertaking and a big ask to say, uh, sit down and read this to somebody. I've got 350 pages here. Read it now. Yes. And even if you're writing uh, fantasy, it, you are writing something very revealing about yourself. You know, even if it's completely fictional, you're revealing what you're interested in and what your mind does when nobody's looking. And That's so right. it's, it's yeah. really a thing we do. Well, a lot of authors get frustrated that everything is seen as autobiographical. Oh, look at these insights into Philip Roth or these insights into Toni Morrison. And they tend to get frustrated by that. But what you say is true. It's every, there are a million choices that you make word by word, sentence by sentence, character by character. So it has to be revelatory. How could it not be saying something about who you are or what you value or uh, what uh, what titillates you and so on? Exactly. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, you make a good point. So what about, um, there's so many people who are insecure. I feel that their lives are out of control. We, as, as we live, we learn that, uh, I think that uh, we, we really are not in control of our lives. We, we can do what we can um, to put our lives on a good course, but there's disruptors along the way. So when, we, when you write fiction, and not you specifically, Jess, but just people, it is an act of creating something that you can control. And I'm, I'm not necessarily saying people write because it gives them a, a better psychological handle on on life but it could be that it could be that people feel that this is something i can't control i can't play god here and these characters are going to do exactly what i tell them to do they're going to encounter the the kind of um obstacles or impediments that uh i decide on and they're going to get out of this trouble in ways that are i'll, I'll figure it out as i go whatever do you think there's there's some uh in other words, Jess, you have a control issue. <laughs> I, I tease you, but. Oh, no. Yeah, I totally do. In fact, I wrote a children's book called uh, Claudette the Dragon with Control Issues because I do. But <laughs> I think the question, the broader question and what you're getting toward is, is there is there something about reading and also writing that makes us feel like we can control the uncontrollable? And I think whether or not writers are specifically going for that there is a lot of science out there that shows creating a cohesive story uh, allows you to release stress. It allows you to release trauma. If that's what you're working with, it allows you to see the world differently. It, it's, it almost has a, a homeopathic effect where you take a small dose of something and your body builds up a response to it, like a vaccine almost. And so whether or not people are deliberately writing for that 
coherence, they still get the benefits of it. And it's also, it's also why we read. Yeah. And that's another good point. The whole act of writing, whether you're going to hit pay dirt or not, the way Jess has done, um, the act of writing is therapeutic, or at least it can be therapeutic, depending on how you approach it. I'm sure you, you've obviously written blog posts on, on the subject. You know, it's a form of paying attention to yourself. And I always think back to that Ford Motor Company study where they went into the factory floor and they said to people, what can we do to make things better here for you, make you more productive? I said, you know, we, the lighting's kind of low. If you could turn the lighting up a bit. So they, they turned the lighting up and people got more productive. And mm -hmm. they decided, wow, uh, let's turn the lighting up even brighter. And over time, they, they brightened the lighting, and they, but they went back to people and said, what could we do, you know, anything that we need to do here? You know, it's almost, it's really kind of too bright, the lighting here. Can you turn <laughs> the lighting down a little bit? Long story short, what they figured out is it wasn't the lighting as it wasn't um, a lot of other things they did. It was simply paying attention. Once mm -hmm. employees knew that they were being paid attention to, they felt better about what they were doing. They felt better about their employer and, and that they were valued. Writing is an act of self. Um, well, it's an act of self of obsession for a lot of people. The, I think probably for genuine, truly, truly people who are born to write, I think it is an act of self obsession. It's also a, a means of, of for the non-professional writer, as you say, somebody who doesn't necessarily even think about, wouldn't even show the copy to other people, but, it can still be a means of paying attention to yourself and and a little bit of self nurturing, perhaps. Or is that I completely? Be, I believe. Completely so. frivolous? Yeah, there's a study, and I want to say it's out of Australia, but it's a fairly recent study where they were working with narrative therapy on patients who had visible wounds, a cut, uh, something like that, in a hospital, and the patients who wrote 15 minutes a day on anything. It didn't have to be about what they were in the hospital for physically healed faster than the patients who didn't write about it. And so there really is something about just allowing yourself to pay attention to yourself that really is powerful. Do you have access to that study or is that one of those those that kind of came and went? I'm just wondering if there's a link or anything of that sort to it. I, I included it in my book, Rewrite Your Life, but I can't remember the specifics of it, but there is a full uh listing of the studies in that book but you maybe just put narrative therapy australia wound healing into google and see what ah, there we go i'm gonna look it up i'm gonna look it up because um i'm really interested in that that sounds like a great topic so you were uh, you are a retired now professor of creative writing and sociology two of the classes i took when i was in college were sociology classes i loved sociology i even thought about yeah. changing majors to it uh it's it's just such an interesting field of study talk about your um we can, we'll talk about creative writing, but I'm curious about sociology. Um, you mentioned that you're a people watcher. It's a really interesting subject area. What got you onto sociology back when you were studying? It, so back when I was studying, I was already teaching creative writing. And so I had a tenured position doing that. Uh, but I but I really am interested in social change in, in not just observing and recording, but actively um, giving people access to more creative critical thinking, more resources, and just generally a more equitable society. And so that's what drew me to sociology was I did not want to just observe, but I also wanted to affect change. And it just really, especially uh, conflict theory and sociology just really spoke to this idea that we're not just here to consume and die. <laughs> we're on this planet to, to help everybody around us to make sure we all rise together. And so that's finding out why people tick was secondary but primary was how do we how do we what do we do with this brief time on earth to make it better for everyone you know what's been stunning to me is uh, you know as i get older in watching how social change will happen so quickly and out of the blue there are things that we didn't think would ever happen in our lifetime i'll give you an example uh, i never thought marijuana would be a, a legal substance in this country mm -hmm. and it is uh, gay marriage, the, the opinion, social, uh, the electorate's opinion, social attitudes change. They seem hardened, but then they change very quickly. Or even something political like the like the Iron Curtain falling, it it, mm -hmm. it was almost like we had no warning. It just all of a sudden, boom, uh, these um, 
you know, satellite countries of the Warsaw Pact, the Warsaw Pact countries are under Soviet domination, are suddenly mm -hmm. freed and the walls coming down. It's like, wow, when change happens, it happens fast. Is that a good thing on the individual level in people's lives? Because we all try to enact some kind of changes in our life. It seems like individuals maybe aren't even as good at it as societies are, because it's really hard to change, don't you think? It is really hard as individuals to change. And, you know, it comes full circle from sociology back to writing, because I think who gets to tell the story really affects our perception of what happens. And so I think, for example, from the outside looking in, I agree with you that it seems like gay marriage was just all of a sudden legalized. But from the from the people who had to struggle just to be recognized for decades, I bet it feels a lot different. And so the idea that I think there's always people out there fighting for what's right, but maybe they don't have access to the media or the storytelling machine. And which is why I think we're seeing a lot of big change these days because social media for better or for worse spreads information so quickly. Um, but I think it's important to be informed storytellers so that we can, I think, I think storytelling is part of social change. I really do think it's a powerful agent. Mm -hmm. So what about uh, creative writing instruction when you were uh, teaching creative writing? What were some of the components of what you conveyed to those students or whether they be writing exercises or, or kind of the mindset that you tried to instill, instill within them? Um, basically, I'm, I'm really asking, how did you teach creative writing? Because there are people who say, you're either a writer or you're not. It's not something you, you can necessarily teach. I think it, I absolutely think it's something you can teach. But here's the thing about my evolution as a teacher matched my evolution as a writer. And so I started out being very <laughs> controlling, right? I really had an idea of how a story should be told and what grade you would get for telling it the way that I thought it should be told. And then as I grew up, and to, to circle back to our previous comment, there's so little you can really control in life. And so now my writing, as well as my teaching, when I lead writing workshops, has evolved to helping people find out what story it is they want to tell. And then if they want to get it published, accessing the tools to get it published. And so there are so many different kinds of stories and so many different ways they can be told, but there needs to be some honesty to them, fiction or not, there needs to be some honesty to them for them to resonate with other people. And so that's what my instruction is focused, focused about now is helping people get to the story they really want to tell. Because you still, uh, although you're not, uh, you've retired from being a professor, you lead women's writing retreats still to I, this day. Is that right? Yeah, I'm going to be in Italy in September, in Tuscany in September 2023, doing, leading a women's writing retreat. But I also, for all sorts of organizations, teach writing workshops to just, you know, one or two hour or one or two day events. But yeah, I love the women's writing retreats. It's all, it's everything I've learned about writing, but I don't have to do any grading. I can just encourage, I can just connect them with resources. I don't have to, I don't have to criticize or grade. Right, right. So it's all positive. It's all good feeling and you're going to great places. Yeah. Let's, Let's talk about your beginnings, because you you, you um, say that you wrote your first novel when you were 26 years old. It featured three women traveling across the United States. It sounds almost like Thelma Louise plus one. <laughs> and um, then you've got three three women suspiciously like myself, you say, in the uh, um, uh, and, and, and it went on from there. But you say, like most first novels, it was embarrassingly self-involved and, and, and full of overwritten descriptions. Uh, why do you think with first novels, because I've had the same experience my yeah, where for the first two or three, I wrote myself into a corner, but the whole idea of the self being, you know, embarrassingly self-involved and overwritten, why do we do that? What is it that compels us to write in that fashion, thinking that this is going to be uh, the hit that we're looking for? Any <laughs> thoughts on that? Well, first of all, you really did your research and I don't, I'm a little upset about that because <laughs> <laughs> my first novel was awful and I thought it was fantastic. I sent it out to 25 agents and I got 25 rejections and I just thank God that uh, independent publishing wasn't as easy then as it is now, or that stinker would be out there. But I think that for me, anyhow, it was, it was in service of the fact that I was 26. And so in your 20s, 
I think unless you are gifted with exceptional self-awareness, you really think the world revolves around you and you have a hard time connecting with larger um, archetypal issues, archetypal themes. And so you just write what you know. And it, it was, it was just, for me, it was just awful. And then I think also, except for a few lucky people, writing is like anything else. You're not going to be great at it the first time out of the gate. I mean, you would not be, you would not expect in your first time playing basketball that you'd be at a professional basketball player level. It takes work. It takes time and revision. When you say that uh, one of the ways that you tried to, to uh, ameliorate the issue was that you started adding, adding adjectives. You added more adjectives <laughs> yeah, and you said that, you know, and that didn't net me a three book deal. So you, you actually decided I'll take a sabbatical from writing and I'll go out and get a real job, quote unquote, real job. Um, and then that's where, where you did a lot of edu- self-education. It sounds like when I say self-education, I mean, you went to school, you got two master's degrees, one in English, one in sociology, and, and you started teaching uh, at a rural technical college uh, where are you located now? What state or city are you in? I'm in Minneapolis. Oh, many. Okay. The Twin Cities. Yeah. Um, so, but the, although you did all of this, you said that you couldn't stop thinking about book ideas. They they kept coming to you and then you started writing again. How long a gap was it when you, when you said, okay, sabbatical time to when those ideas brought you back to the keyboard? What kind of time span was that? Yeah. So when I, when I got the 25 rejections on that first novel, which was my master's thesis, I really sort of wanted to take my soccer ball and go home and I wasn't going to play with anybody anymore. And I, I mean, you mentioned my degrees and my education, but most writers have um, for sure don't have an MFA or a PhD. Many of them, if they have a four-year degree, it's not in creative writing. And I really think the beauty of writing is that it's very accessible and the to my mind, the better writers are the ones who aren't trained. And so what really got me back into writing was not my formal education, but I got schooled by life. And so I was teaching full time. Um, I was married, I was pregnant. And on 9-11, my then husband committed suicide. And it was obviously um, jarring. It was awful. And the world was jarred. So I was in sort of this social as well as individual Uh, destruction. And I ended up hospitalized. Uh, They thought I was going to miscarry my son who was 20. He's fine. He's wonderful. They thought I was going to miscarry because of all this stress. And my doctor said, you need to journal. Like you need to, in addition to seeing a therapist, which I also did and highly recommend, he said, you need to journal. You need to get uh, this anxiety, this stress out on paper, or it's going to kill your son. And so I started writing a novel instead, because journaling seemed so self-indulgent that I decided I was going to write a mystery novel. And I wasn't really reading mysteries at the time, but I, and I, I did when I was younger, but I got away from it. And so I thought I want to write something closed, right? It's got a closed plot, a beginning, middle, end. I want to write something with justice. I want to mm-hmm. write something with answers. And so I wrote Mayday, which was my first, ended up being my first published book. And then once I, I wasn't, cognizant of of what I was doing that I was writing my way out of trauma but I just once I found out the honest story I wanted to tell which is about secrets which is about connections I just kept going and so it was more about life what life taught me than what any of my classes taught me so that was the traumatic life event that you mentioned uh, and I was gonna, yeah. your husband had now he wasn't directly he wasn't at at the site of the no. attack no. This, but he was traumatized by the whole thing, like the rest of us. And, yeah, he, and that pushed him over the edge, it sounds like. Yes, exactly. Wow. Yeah. And so I, and I, and I speak about this in my TEDx talk, but how, how I was lucky that that doctor said that. And I found my way back to writing because it really was a ladder that pulled me up and out. And I wrote, so Mayday, my first book, it's a humorous mystery. It's, it's hopefully very funny. And so it's not, on the face of it, the sort of thing you'd think a person would write, but I wrote what I needed. And I, and I continue to do that 22 books later. Tell us about the TEDx uh, talk or talks. Is it one or, or have you done a couple of TEDx talks? I just did the one. I have never watched it. It was in 2016. I think it's called Rewrite Your Life, uh, same as my book's name. And it was, I was talking to my friend 
Cindy, who's also a sociologist, uh, maybe eight years ago, and I was just telling her how powerful writing has been for me. And she said, well, you need to do a TED Talk. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> like most <laughs> writers, I do not want to be on a stage talking. Um, but she convinced me. She convinced me to write the book about it and then to do the TED Talk. And I, like I said, I still haven't watched it. It came out in 2016. I blacked out. You walk on stage, you walk in that big red circle. It's a huge audience. There's cameras everywhere and you share your most personal story. And so I have no, I'm just glad I didn't like start bleeding like a sheep. Like ah, while I was up on stage. So <laughs> why, did you never, did. why did you never watch it? I'm not going to ever watch it either because in my head, it was the doing it, right? It was the doing it. I don't want to pick apart any mannerisms. I don't want to pick apart how I was standing mm. on that stage, what I wished I had said instead, said instead. I just want to remember that I did it. And I'm proud of that. Yeah, it's a big deal. It's not uh, an easy thing to do. Um, with May Day, I think I have this right. You, you ended up writing a book, a novel that was fewer than 50,000 words. Mm -hmm. But you ended up deciding that it was too short, that the publishers wanted something a little beefier, like as, as if, you know, readers might feel like if I'm going to pay, you know, $12.99 for paperback or $21 for a hardcover. Yeah. Um, I want I want this to be, uh, you know, I want the word count that's commensurate with the, what I'm paying and the amount of time I'm going to be reading it. Is that, talk a little bit about that. You did end up expanding it. You pumped it up to 52,000 words. Is that right? <laughs> so, yeah, that was May Day. And my first draft was was 50,000 words. So it's a humorous mystery. And I was living in rural Minnesota with dial-up internet and a dot matrix printer. And I was writing 50 query letters a day, print them out on that dot matrix printer. I can hear it. I can hear the noise it makes right now. And then, you know, you pull off those little edges. And then I would send off those 50 query letters. And then I'd start getting rejections. I'd send off 50 more. And somewhere in that sort of blizzard of rejections I was receiving, somebody said, Mayday has promise, but it's only 50,000 words. And so if you can pump it up and also write a sequel, because mystery readers love a series, then we might consider it. And so I, said, so I wrote more of this thing that wasn't selling. So then I had however many words on Mayday and Junebug, which was the sequel, and it, it eventually worked. And so I'm, Mayday, I'm proud of Mayday. It's my first novel. It's very rough around the edges. Um, but it did eventually find a home with, with Midnight Inc., which was at the time a, uh, an imprint of Llewellyn, a small Minnesota mystery publisher. Interesting. So along the way there, uh, you, there you are in the mystery uh, genre. But you said you had done research that included reading of almost 40 books in the mystery genre. When you mm -hmm. were doing that research and reading those mystery novels, what did you learn? What did you see there that you decided I, I'm going to apply? You know what I, what I learned that surprised me, and it shouldn't have, but that mysteries have, crime fiction has such great character development. So the ones that really stuck with me um, like a William Kent Kruger or a Sue Grafton or in the early days, Janet Ivanovich, um, they, the mysteries were satisfying. Of course they are. It propels the plot, but the characters felt real and complex and whole and like people I wanted to not necessarily hang out with, but that I was happy. I was, I was getting to watch as they lived their life. And so that's what really surprised me is just I think once you get a master's in English, they teach you to look down on genre fiction, whether it's romance, mystery, sci-fi, fantasy, and you forget that those are popular because they've got really good storytelling in them. And you cannot have good storytelling without good characters. Yeah, exactly. So when you have a character, do you think about likability and do you think about the arc uh, this character is going to evolve or devolve along the way? How, how much... Is that a factor or do you go more by feel, more by uh, intuition? Yeah, I'm an outliner and I'm gathering that you are a pantser. Do you do you outline or do you pants? You know, I tried to be ex to extemporize or what do you call it? Pants? Yeah, the pantser or a plotter. <laughs> no, I'm more uh, and I don't think of myself as a plotter, but I do. But I do. I, I, I work with an outline because I when I didn't, I wrote myself into a corner. 
but I sure. don't do a heavy outline because I want to feel that there's a lot of organic, uh, you know, material along the way that I'm not just sticking because sticking to a blueprint because you know an outline can could be very detailed or it could be like a gesture drawing so right what are your outlines like are they how detailed do you get yeah it sounds like we write pretty similarly so i start out with uh, a story b story and so a one sentence a story this is the overarching plot like i'm going to destroy the death star and then the b story which is the character arc um so like luke is going to find his own power if we're doing star wars so i come up with a one sentence a story b story because that's my compass for the book and then i just do a one sentence per scene outline and so a book has uh 80 90 scenes and so i'll have 80 or 90 sentences and it reads if i do it right it reads like a cohesive story with all the ups and downs and twists and turns and uh character development and so once i have that and i know it'll hang together then I start writing and I write 2000 words a day. Uh, sometimes I will change the sentences, but usually it sticks with a pretty close version of that first uh, overarching summary of the book. So and it makes do... it... Oh, go, oh, go ahead. ahead, finish that thought. I was going to say it makes it more fun to write because uh, I feel lost if I, I don't know if it's going to make it into the book or not. If I don't, if I'm enjoying writing the scene, but I don't know if it's something that is in service of the A story or the B story. I feel very lost and I tend to find any reason not to write that day. So having that overarching blueprint is really uh, helps me to stay disciplined. Now, did you say you'll do one sentence per scene? You'll. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So how does that, give us an example. Could you just get, maybe you remember a sentence from a past novel for a scene, um, it's almost like it sounds like what you do is you're just it's a stage setter is what yeah. it is. And then you know what to do from there. Yeah, exactly. That's a great description of it. So I just finished outlining um, a young adult novel, the first in the trilogy. And one sentence would be and they're not even necessarily complete sentences, but it would be something like uh, Rose trains today and she realizes um, she has a physical sensation remembering that she misses her mother and she uses that to. Um, uncover this secret and so it'll just be something like that gotcha Interesting. and it leaves, room, it leaves room for the creative process because I don't know the dialogue I don't know the physicality I just know what generally has to happen for it to fit in the story and then I get to do all the fun creative stuff knowing that that I can use it later so you end up ended up getting that bite from that agent who said if you do this and that we might be interested is is that person your agent to this day no <laughs> they never picked it up and actually the agent who i who i ended up signing with number 424 after 423 rejections uh she never sold my book and i ended up dropping her and then my second agent sold my book i am now on my fourth agent um the second agent who sold my book was was not we didn't have a great rapport and so i found my third agent uh victoria skernick who i love we are still friends but she just couldn't sell my books um and that's it wasn't for lack of trying she did everything right uh so we parted ways amicably and now i'm with jill marshall who is phenomenal we're just a really good fit together interesting so so you've got that uh um tucked away you've got your mystery novels you end up having kids in you uh that led you to the ya um the ya category is that right because you had children you have two of your own yeah. you you married a man with uh, a couple of sons so you're a kind of a brady bunch family or a blended family well, and, actually uh, i got a i got a pandemic divorce from him but <laughs> oh okay <laughs> that'll do it won't it <laughs> That'll do it. But I do. I do have my uh, my daughter lives in, in Chicago and she writes for Bust Magazine. And my son just moved home to get his uh, save money while he got his psychology degree. But yes, when they were younger, I was writing crime fiction, which um, there was not age appropriate for them. So I started reading what they were reading, which was young adults. And I decided I wanted to write something um, that they would read. And so I wrote the Toad House trilogy but only the first books. So the, so the title is a lie. Um, and I paid them both 20 bucks to read it. And 
I paid them before they read it and they just have to this day never read that book. Oh, they owe yeah. you some money back. Yeah, some uh. kids, those <laughs> kids, I tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> did you find that when you wrote uh, for the YA genre, did were you carrying over some uh, characteristics of crime writing that you realized that, uh, hey, I'm I'm kind of trying to do a crime novel as YA, or do, or maybe you did do it that way, and that's what 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 works for you. Was there any any uh, habits about crime writing or mindset about crime writing? that you had to kind of disabuse yourself of for the YA novel? Like, did it, did it leak over to it? And then it may, maybe in a good or bad way. I would say in a good way. I think there's no better training ground for story structure than writing crime fiction. And, and as I said earlier, the best crime fiction has really complex characters and oftentimes tackles social justice issues in a really powerful way but at its heart at its most basic crime fiction is just a really juicy plot and there is no book that is not made better by by ramping up the page turning factor of it yeah yeah so who are some of your favorite crime writers who did you maybe learn the most from or are most inspired by maybe even emulated a bit yeah, there are so many phenomenal crime writers out there. I One of the best books I read last year, and it's not even the best crime fiction book, but it does happen to be crime fiction, is Tracy Clark's book, Hide, like hide and seek, but it's Hide. And it's a police procedural set in modern day Chicago. I don't usually read police procedurals. It's just not my subgenre. Um, but I was asked to read an early copy of this one. And oh my God, it is so good. So Tracy Clark, for sure. I love uh, Tana French. She's mm -hmm. an Irish writer. Mm -hmm. And Kate Atkinson, who I, I think is a UK writer. Um, William Kent Kruger is fantastic. Uh, I do read a lot of crime fiction. And so I try to keep up on the new authors too. Uh, Rachel Housel Hall is not a new author, but she is also brilliant. Nobody does metaphor better than Rachel. I love her stuff. Wow. So yeah, those are probably my favorite cry oh megan abbott oh my goodness megan abbott i i wait for her next book to come out and i um before i write a crime fiction book i reread rachel housel hall and megan abbott books to to get me into the mindset of really strong characters with really beautiful language it's amazing how that works where you can read um you can read writing and it puts you in that proper mindset uh, and exactly. gives you more facility with your own writing. You know, I, I do that. My day job as a magazine editor, when I have somebody contributing a piece, I always say, you know, the ideal tone is The Economist magazine. Just mm -hmm. go to the website, read a couple of articles from The Economist before you write this piece. And it's amazing how when you read something it's like, ah, I get it. It's an old show, don't tell. You can explain things to people, but if they actually read something uh, and you obviously know what your what your source material is, what really gets you um, kind of in the channel. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it just really cues up, um, cues up the sort of voice I want to find. Well, evidence that this is working for you is that is the fact that you have written two books a year since 2006. That's that's a lot of productivity. Now, you said 2000 words a day. That's a lot of word. That's a big word count, because if I was to calculate that, um, let me see here. I have <laughs> a calculator on my phone. <laughs> so if you're doing 2000 and uh, let's say you, uh, that's 60,000 words a month. I mean, assuming yeah. that you're, that's a 30 day month and you're writing every day, that's 60,000 words. You're really looking at a novel per month or now, obviously you're throwing a lot of copy away because it's not like you're going to keep everything you're writing, but talk about the process. How do you, how do you, because you do tell people, look, even if it's 15 minutes a day, that's therapeutic. Mm -hmm. You're writing professionally though. You're cranking out 2000. You must sit down certain days and feel like I'm, it's an effort to get to 2000 today. Or maybe it's never that. that. Do, you, or do you just lapse into stream of consciousness if you have to? It's an, eff, it's an effort every day. But so I, I outline for about two weeks. And so once I have that cohesive outline, it's not so hard to write 2,000 words. And it does take me about six weeks to get that first draft. I think for me, besides having an outline, what really works is I have an accountability partner. 
Uh, in my case, it's Shannon Baker, another great mystery author. Um, and we text each other every day if we meet our word count. And I am so Minnesotan and driven by shame that I get my <laughs> word count done so I don't have to tell her I failed. Uh, but yes, I do. I do sometimes just lapse into stream of consciousness, which I again can do because I've got that uh, that one sentence summary. So I know I know what land that has to fall into, and so I can just sort of open the gates and see what comes out. Yeah, and you know, people I think sometimes they think of stream of consciousness as completely undirected. But I used mm -hmm. to talk to people about channeled stream of consciousness. It's it's yes, it's stream of consciousness. Yes, you're telling yourself, I'm not going to let my fingertips stop moving, but all the copy that you're writing is directed at a particular thing. It's a character, it's that scene or whatever. So yeah. you're not just randomly running off uh, at the fingertips and saying, I got to get my laundry done today. I need to do this. I need to do that. You keep it focused on like a laser on the scene or the character or the event or what have you. Is that correct? That is exactly right. And so I actually don't throw out uh, very many or any words. I end up using everything at the end of at the end of the day. Sometimes I have to move it around a little bit, but it's all in service of the story I've decided I want to tell. So how much time per day uh, on your average day of uh, when you're in the writing process, do you spend two, three, four hours a day? What's your time frame? It's the right, just the pure writing to get to those 2000 words is usually two to three hours. And then, and the thing they don't tell you is how much um, marketing work comes with being a full-time writer. So the mornings I try to put aside for writing and then the afternoons uh, for marketing or editing. If I'm working on another, if I'm editing another book. Now, do you have, uh, I, I see a note here to ask you about a journal. Do you keep a nightstand journal, you know, one next to the bed? <laughs> Is that, I, is that something you currently do or is that something from your past? I have a dream journal next to my bed just because like every writer, I've been woken up in the middle of the night with some brilliant idea that I think I will remember the next morning and I never do. So I just, I keep a dream journal. So I, I write it down. Um, now that I do that, and I've been doing it for about 10, 15 years, I don't, the things that I think are brilliant are not are not that brilliant. The, I, I write about this in my book, Rewrite Your Life, but this was maybe eight years ago. I was woken up in the middle of the night by this transformative, going to be my bestseller book idea, wrote it down without turning on the lights, because that's the whole point of the dream journal is you don't have to fully wake up. And then the next morning when I woke up, I not only forgot the idea, I forgot I had had an idea until I got to work. And so I'm teaching, I'm in front of the class and I'm like, oh my God, I just had the idea that means I can be a full-time writer. And I almost left work to go read it, but I finished teaching, rush home, read the dream journal. And it is three lines of dialogue that I wrote down. And the first line is woman, colon, I got a writing potato. <laughs> Next line is man, colon, what's a writing potato? Third line, woman, colon, Yukon gold. <laughs> that, was my, that was my whole idea. It was nothing. It was nonsense. So my dream journal, yes, I keep it. But most of my writing I do sitting up in the daylight consciously. You know, that is so much what a dream is like where yet yeah, you have that dream <laughs> and then it is. Uh, yeah, I'm actually looking for a quotation here from uh, John Updike, who wrote about uh, the delicate structure of the dream. And I'm not finding it here right now, unfortunately, but he talked about how you have to, um, you know, capture that delicate structure of the dream before it's crushed by the day's um, yeah. events. Uh, <laughs> it, it's amazing how quickly it slips away, how, how fast it is that, that uh, um, it's like I've got, I remember I was in a certain place, but all the details just fly away. You yeah. say, you know, you mentioned uh, once the pump is primed, the story unfolds. Is what is the priming of the pump? Is that the outline, and or is that the fact that you're producing a lot of words? You're not just sitting there struggling. You kind of force yourself to go ahead and get something going here. Yeah, I force my I force myself to go ahead. And when I when I get to the end of a project, it's always continues to be interesting to me that I can't tell the difference 
between the days I struggled and the days that it flowed when I read the manuscript, right? It all sort of comes together, even though some days felt like I was just pushing water uphill. And so for me, yeah, priming the pump is getting that outline and then just putting myself in the chair. Uh, some days when I get truly stuck, I've started to to uh, dictate my story. And so I'll just walk around the lakes here in Minneapolis and speak into my phone like I am right now. And I'll just use the word function to record what I'm saying. And in 45 minutes, I can speak about 2,500 words of a story. I have to edit the heck out of those, but it's a way to push me past that pushback. Yeah, that's, um, I've talked about that before. That's a great tool to be able to walk take your recorder now the recorder's right in the phone these days or take take a yeah. an olympic recorder or whatever it is but um the brain stimulation of movement i it's, i always think it's so antithetical that writers sit and they're sedentary because that doesn't really spur brain stimulation it's even driving in a car for me having passing images um mm -hmm. helps me think of ideas and and record them but um my first book in particular that, that, that I completed was a lot of walking and talking to, into a recorder uh, mm. for the reason that when I was walking before, I'd have these ideas and I think I got to get home because I got to write these things down. I'm not going to remember all of this stuff because it was really I, coming to me. So you know what that's about, uh, having the recorders essential. Yeah, Just like the your dream escapes, your, your, your thoughts on your walk can escape. Exactly. And now with your phone, you can dictate and it will put it it will type it for you and so it's not always very accurate to what you're saying but it's usually close enough that you can figure it out and so it really feels productive yeah brings it back yes uh, and, and it expands your writing time and speeds mm -hmm. it up yeah because you can speak faster than usually than than you can type exactly um, what do you tell people like for instance your students what do you tell them in terms of if you had a serious student who said you know i want to get published how do i find an agent um, what, what advice do you have for people who say, oh, yeah, I want to find somebody who wants to take me on as a, as a client and get me published? Yeah. I mean, the, the basics are first you have your manuscript complete and then you have it edited. If, if not by a professional freelance editor, then by uh, a writing group you trust. And so you've got your project, you've got it edited. And then it really is, unless you happen to know somebody who can introduce you to their agent, it really is just a querying game where you, where you go to conferences and you meet agents or you uh, go to the back of books that you loved and are like the book that you've written and find out the authors almost always thank their agents, find out who their agents are. I also steer people toward uh, AAR, the Association of Author Representatives. And it's an easy to use website of vetted agents and there's a drop down menu so you can say okay i wrote historical fiction who is accepting historical fiction queries and it'll list all of them plus their contact information uh, plus exactly what they're looking for like first 10 pages first 50 pages complete manuscript whatever it is and then you just start querying now you say uh, you know submit your work to at least a hundred agents and small presses. So uh, small presses will actually take work. You don't necessarily have to be represented by an agent. Is that the idea? A small press will look at your work and see whether it's, they are it, dazzled. Exactly. So you, many small presses, uh, you can be unagented, and they'll look at your work. And actually, there are some medium presses as well. Uh, the downside is their distribution is usually pretty limited. And so I started with a small press and I learned so much and I am so grateful for it. Um, but everybody in that press left to go on to bigger things and the, and the press actually closed down eventually. But um, it's a starting point. It's not ever going to be the big career maker, but it's a good way to build a long career uh, to start out at a small press. So what about the query letter that goes to the agent? Let, let's let's just stick with agents right now. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people who say, oh, that's just so critical. You've got to have this really good uh, query letter. There are agencies out there that tell you exactly how they want them structured, which means that everybody mm -hmm. is kind of using the same. There, there's got to be a, a, a sameness at times mm -hmm. to um all of the uh, letters that they get, all the queries that they get. Uh, I would always strive to get to, to 
put something together that might have a different feel to it. Did, mm. did, is that something you would do or you would advise that to try to make it stand out to some degree? Obviously, there's certain essentials that have to be there. But yeah. Uh, like right. for instance, put, they will tell you they will tell you how many pages they want to see first ten pages, first twenty five mm -hmm. pages. But then the query itself, it would seem, it would seem that's almost um, secondary to to the actual sample you're giving them. But people treat the query letter like it's um, the make or break. I actually hired somebody to edit my query letter because it's marketing language, which is completely different than creative writing. Uh, the, when it comes to query letters, my advice is always to keep it very short and keep it keep it simple, because oftentimes it's going to be read by interns, um, and you just want something that basically says, "I know what I'm doing," and I really want you to take a look at my book. And then, it, then the writing speaks for itself. And so, a short and sweet query letter that grabs their attention, uh, lists some comp titles makes clear that you understand what this agent represents and that you have the full manuscript ready to go. And then I, then I send that off. Now you mentioned attending conferences uh, in your uh, conferences for writers in your genre. So mm -hmm. which you've done and you meet agents there and then you meet an agent. And what do you say to an agent when you meet, meet an agent? I mean, what kind of advice would you give in terms of what an agent needs to hear from you to, to maybe be interested or what might be relevant to them? Well, I am such an interpersonal dork that I might not be the one, the one to look to for advice for this, but my friends who are agents uh, really appreciate somebody being respectful. Uh, I, I know agents who have been followed into the bathroom and had manuscripts handed to them underneath the stall. And so to just be really respectful um, and just say, hey, I, I, I know you represent these people. I think you're doing great work. Uh, would you be willing to look at my manuscript? And they're almost always going to say yes. They're almost always going to say yes. So you just want to be friendly um, and and normal, unlike unlike how I would show up. And they're probably going to say yes. What is the most rewarding part of the writing process for you? When you sit and write, and you've done your two thousand words or more, yeah. um, what 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 kind what is are the uh, real rewards to you, or the the single uh, you know, psychic uh, reward you get from writing? Yeah, so I think I, for me, there's two different kinds. And one is the day-to-day -day that keeps me going. And that is when I complete either the outline goal for the day or the word count for the day, at the end of it, I feel righteous. Like I've just done a really good workout. And that that 20 years into this, I still get that same feeling. The only difference is now I give myself a sticker. <laughs> <laughs> I legit have <laughs> rainbow stickers and I'll put a rainbow sticker on my calendar when I have good writing days. because it's easy to forget. It's easy to forget that I'm doing okay, that I'm making progress, but then there's the larger overall um, feeling. And this one is when you have written your book and you know, it's not perfect, but that you said what you wanted to say. And so my book, the Corey girls, which came out November 1st, um, it's, I think, the best thing I've ever written. And, I, and I, I did what I wanted to do with that book. It's not perfect. I'm sure if I read it again, I changed things. But I really wanted to tell the story of how toxic secrets are in a small town and how people, and specifically girls and women, can come together uh, to heal and to build something better while still being entertaining. Right? I still wanted it to be a, a crime fiction novel. I still wanted it to be something that keeps you up past your bedtime. And I, and I think I hit it. And that is a really good feeling that I'm trying to internalize. So what does the dust cover on Quarry Girls say? We're, give, us the, give us the overview of, of, the, of the story. We know that in small towns, how corrosive secrets can be. Um, yeah. Can you expand on that a little bit? Sure. Like my, like my last four books, uh, it is inspired by a true crime that I was on the periphery of. And so with the Cory girls, it's set in 1977, St. Cloud, Minnesota, which is a real town in St. Cloud and where I lived in the seventies, I was a little girl. Uh, and there were at the time two and possibly three serial killers operating. They never caught the third. And it became this very, in my neighborhood, very terrifying backbeat to being a child, to just knowing that things were bad and scary and dangerous, but because of your age, you can't really make any more sense of it than that. And so the book is set, like I said, in 1977, St. Cloud, it features uh, Heather Cash, who is uh, 
coming of age. It's an adult book, but it's also a coming of age story in a time when there are serial killers operating and her home life isn't exactly what she thinks it is. And it's also set uh, above tunnels, which actually exist in St. Cloud, Minnesota. There were tunnels connecting this planned community to a big factory in the 1920s and the tunnels are still there beneath the houses which is for me such a great metaphor of of the secrets that we keep that i worked into the book yes yes great idea so Mm -hmm. um you mentioned when you have a good writing day what constitutes a good writing day for you yeah, so it's a, it's. I mean, obviously, meeting my word count, but it's more of it's more of a feeling. It's more of, um, you know, when you have something stuck in your throat and you cough it out. It's such a gross <laughs> metaphor, <laughs> but it's like it's getting rid of that bit of discomfort and getting it out. It's a story untold. I think is a little bit uncomfortable, and so you just get it out in bits. And you know the story that you're looking to tell that day because you're working on that particular scene. You're working with that scene sentence, the sentence from the outline. So each day when you sit down, once once you, you've completed that outline, which you say you'll spend, what, a couple of weeks on, two, two or three weeks putting yeah. the outline together. And, mm-hmm. um, okay, interesting. So um, now you've dabbled in other genres. Are you, is that something that's kind of out of your system? And you're good with with what's there and you're focused now entirely on mysteries? Or do you still think you're going to be a bit of a wanderer? I'm for sure going to be a wanderer. I have a um, I just signed another two book contract with Thomas and Mercer and they published my crime fiction. Um, But I also signed a three book contract for young adult. I will write I will write whatever the story whatever shape the story comes to me. I will I will write it. So I think probably young adult and crime fiction are my two first loves when it comes to writing, but I've got an idea for a women's fiction story I want to do. I've got an idea for a high fantasy uh, sword and sorcery book I want to do if I ever get the time. Interesting. So our guest has been Jess Lowry. She's the author of crime fiction, nonfiction, children's books, YA adventures, and magical realism. Uh, you are wide ranging uh, in your appetites and your writing, Jess. Thank you uh, very much for coming on the program. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me.